Welcome to the Unlocking the Club podcast, where we host honest and direct conversations about journeys of access, personal truth, and reclaiming space. We share our truth so that you can find the key to own your truth, honor your journey, and reclaim your space. Grab your keys, your wallet, your phone, and invite your friends to meet you at the club. Here's your host, Angela Taylor. So on today's episode of Unlocking the Club, I am thrilled to be in conversation with Renee Brown. Renee is the Principal Chief Executive Officer of Renee M. Brown, Inc., where her consulting work includes being Head of Executive Engagement at Ready, Set, a diversity, equity, inclusion consultancy. Prior to taking on the important work in DEI, Renee spent 20 years at the Women's National Basketball Association, where she was a pioneer in building the league and shaping the personnel development process that now claims over 1,000 elite players representing 50 plus countries and providing the opportunity to play professionally here in the United States. Renee played a significant role in the establishment of the WNBA in 1997, and the league is now recognized as the longest running women's professional sports league in the United States. Renee was also involved with the USA basketball women's national team for over 20 years, including being an assistant coach for the 1995-96 national team that brought women's basketball to prominence in the United States as they went on to win the gold medal at the 1996 Olympics in Atlanta. That dynamic team is profiled in an ESPN documentary called Dream On. Renee also played a critical role in that program by ensuring diversity and equality in the selection of players and coaching staff. Her leadership with USA Basketball included being the chair of the 2004 and 2008 Olympic Committee, and both teams went on to win gold medals and continued USA women's basketball's dominance around the globe. Renee also made my dream of being an executive in professional sports a reality. And so it is truly an honor to be joined today by a friend, mentor, advisor, and angel. An angel whose wisdom gave me the strength to go back to the hospital and whisper to my mom that I was ready and to let the Lord take her in his wings. Today, thanks for tuning in as we unlock the club with our guest, Renee Brown. Renee, it is so wonderful to see you today. Thanks for joining us on Unlocking the Club. Angela, I'm so happy to be here. And if you could see me really close, I have tears in my eyes. Your your opening was just amazing. And there's so many nuggets that you said to your fans and all your listeners that if you listen really close, there's just so much to learn from. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. Like this, you've been along for the journey and and heard about uh, the concept for unlocking the club for the last few months. And you know how meaningful and important this work is to me. Mm -hmm. And I know that you don't do these interviews quite often. I know that you're private, right? You don't do a lot of podcast interviews intentionally. So I can't tell you how thankful I am to you for making time today to be a guest on this show. Thanks, Angela. And I think one of the main reasons why I wanted to do this is just by listening to you and unlocking the club. And there's so many different things that you said earlier that I just want to reference one. And it's shine. And I think understanding what your intention was and how direct you want to be with your listeners and the whole idea of just showing up as yourself. It's always been important to me, no matter who's around me, no matter who I'm working with and all of my friends. I think back to when I was a kid and I know we all did this. We all sung that song, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Just the other day, I was talking to my 94 year old aunt and a song was on and that was the song. It was a spiritual song. And I have a video of her at 94 singing this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. And I want to say to anyone listening, we all carry a light inside of us. And I refuse to let anyone around me dim their light or allow someone to try to put their light out. And so I think it's something we all need to start thinking about. Our light is in us. How can we brighten that light? Yes. Well, and and Renee, anyone that knows Renee knows that what she just said is true. Like her gift in life is to make sure people turn that light on or keep that light on. And you're a unicorn in that. And it's just being in your company, being in conversation with you, you consistently make sure that whoever it is, whether it's a family member, whether it's a player in the WNBA, 
or friend or colleague that they know that they have a light mm -hmm. and that to make sure that that light is shining. What is it about you that has been the catalyst for that being in your soul? You know, I think it stems back from when I was a kid. You know, I, I had a mother, her name is Evelyn Brown, may she rest in peace. It was actually my stepmom that raised me. And years and years and years ago, she would always tell me that. And she would speak to me about confidence. And one of the main things she would say to me about the whole confidence is that people can't take it from you, you give it away. And that really resonates with me when I think about showing up as yourself, and I think it's important as leaders, as friends, family, that we all recognize that everyone here has something to give. There's a purpose in all of our lives. And I think the worst thing that can happen is for someone, especially someone of leadership, to try to dim somebody else's light to make their light shine brighter. There's a poet, her name is Tanya Marie Evans. And I cannot think of the poem, but what I can remember in the poem, it talks about shine. It's like, you find yours because I know mine. And I think it's very important that we all reach inside of ourselves and tell each other. We got to tell each other. We got to remind ourselves because I think sometimes your light can be dimmed by the things you're saying to yourself. So it's not just what someone's saying to you. A lot of times you got to question, what is the message that you're giving to yourself? Because you can hear the outside noise, but it's the inside noise that will actually dim your light. And so we've got to recognize that as well. Well, the inside noise, and you mentioned a second ago, Renee, that like someone can't take your shine away. You can give it away. Mm -hmm. Like, have you had that experience, a moment where you've given your shine away? Or what were some of the things that uh, led to someone else giving their, their shine away that you've witnessed and seen? Well, I think, yes, I think that probably if we all go back in our lives, we can remember a time where we felt like we had to step back. I actually had a boss say to me one time, she called me in her office, I'm listening to her, and she literally said to me, she said, you know, Renee, like, you know, when you show up, you know, you're just so outgoing and friendly, and what I need for you to do is step back. Yeah. And I, I looked at her, I said, step back, what does that mean? And she couldn't, she couldn't explain it. So I went on to say to her, listen, I'm the child of Evelyn Brown. My mother would roll over in her grave if she thought I had to show up and be different than who I am. So I say to everyone, bring your best self to whatever situation you're in. And if they don't like it, you need to question them, not yourself. And I find so many times as black women, we question ourselves. That whole angry black women crap. Sometimes you need to be an angry black woman. It's okay. But I think at the end of the day, I think that being able to know who you are and how you want to conduct yourself. Because no one can decide that but you. I think it's very important. Yeah, I love how you handle that. And it doesn't go without notice that another woman asked you to step back. And you and I were part of, I talk about it quite a bit on this show, we were part of the initial Inspiring Women Luncheon with Madeline Albright. Mm -hmm. And I remember so powerfully when she said, an audience member had asked her, who some of her biggest female mentors were. And she said, well, look, we need to be better to each other as women. She's like, some of my best mentors have been men. And some of the people that have stood in my way were other women. And so is that something as you were, you know, climbing the ladder, getting to the top of the ecosystem in sports and entertainment, were you noticing like there's this tension between women where maybe it's because there's only room for one of us? You know, I want to add on to what Madeleine Albright said. And she also said there should be a special place in hell for women who won't help other women. And so, of course, I think for me, I've, I've always come and I think it's from my coaching background. And actually, I think from my mother as well. I think it is very important as a woman, especially a woman of color, to embrace any woman that comes through. And I'm not limiting it to any color. But as you grow and as you learn, you should be teaching. I think it's very important. And yes, in my lifetime, I'm sure I've had people, whether they're insecure with themselves, because I find a lot of times when women are kind of like trying to hold people back, I think so much of it is from their own insecurity with themselves. And women, we suffer through all of these things. Is she prettier? Is she thinner? How does she dress? Where did she go to school? That's all nonsense. 
As a leader, you should be lifting people. You should be helping people out. Angela, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but when I was coaching you way back at Stanford, I saw your light way back then. And I felt honored that God gave me, put me in your path to help you see that light that I saw. So it's always been in you. And I'm just going to go ahead and acknowledge one of my favorite people in the world, your mom, Mrs. Taylor. I know Mrs. Taylor had a lot to do with that. And some of us may have our mom. Some of us may have my stepmother, who I know is my mother. Some people may have an aunt, a teacher. There's somewhere someone has helped you. And I think that we need to recognize that. And I think it's up to us. I think it's up to us as women to really help lift women. I agree with that 100%. And I think so often we may get caught up in that negative, right? Mm -hmm. And we actually need to celebrate those stories, right, that we all have where there is someone who's pulling us through, who's encouraging us, Mm -hmm. who is helping us shine our light. And Renee, I have to tell you, I I do remember those days. And, And from day one that I met you, you have been someone who has been advocating for me. And I'm not sure if you remember this. There's a couple different stories at different stages in my journey Mm -hmm. that you played a prominent role. One was uh, before my freshman year, my parents brought me down to Sanford's campus for freshman orientation. We came down a week or so early because my brother was playing football. And so we wanted to catch um, one of his football games before school started for me. I was not on scholarship at Stanford. Uh, and I had been in communication with the coaching staff, um, and you were one of them over the course of the summer, making sure I was doing those summer workouts that we all love. But I had not met you all in person. And so we stopped by the athletic department and we met Tara, we met you. I'm not sure what other coaches were there. And, and you guys welcomed me like I was part of the team already and said, look, you're going to have to try out and gave me some of those details. But the thing that happened after that, as, after we left the office, I was walking down the stairs and um, Sonny Henning, who I had not met, who was a star on the women's basketball team, was walking up the stairs. And I just remember just being in awe. Like this is, you know, someone who I'd watched on TV who was part of that women's team that I wanted to be a part of. And I just remember thinking when we got to the bottom of the stairs after she had passed us, oh my gosh, like that's Sonny Henning. Not 15 seconds later, were you coming to the top of the stairs and saying, Angela, Angela, I want to introduce you to somebody. And you stopped us before we left the athletic department and you introduced us to Sonia. And we had a conversation. And in that moment, Sonia said, hey, we're going to be playing pickup over at Robley at some time. And I was able to actually start getting to know some of the teammates who were on campus at that time. Mm-hmm. But you didn't have to do that. Like, right. We had just left the office, but you take took the time and you in that moment, like, right, how important it would be for me to get to know some of the other teammates. So there was that moment at the beginning of our journey together as friends. And then there's so many moments, to be honest, Renee. Uh, and then there was the moment when I called you, you're a mentor of mine, and let you know that I was getting ready to go to Washington University to go to business school. And you asked me, so why? Like, what is it that you're hoping to accomplish? And I talked about wanting to run an NBA team. And you, I remember you saying, like, I can't help you with that, but I just had a conversation with David Stern. And I'm thinking about working with the WNBA. And would you be interested in considering coming out to work here? And then the last one is you showing up from a mother's funeral and speaking at the celebration of life service about your interaction and who my mother was. Um, You've been that person for me in different stages of my journey. And I just have to say, there's no question here. I just have to say thank you for since day one of being someone who does shine the light and sees the light in all of us. I just want to say thank you, Angela. And I think for all of us, no matter what role we are, no matter what title we have. And sometimes I think we get caught up in titles. I always say, do what's right. Do what's right. Because, you know, you talk about inclusion. So much of it to me is more than inclusion. It's belonging. You had done the work early before you got to Stanford. You know, there was one thing I wanted you to feel. It was a sense of belonging because you had done the work. You didn't have to do the work. You probably did more workouts than the the players under scholarship, to be quite honest. Sorry, all of y'all, but you you know, you probably did. And I think another thing I think that leaders need to understand, surround yourself with people smarter than yourself. You don't have to know it all. I knew when I took the job at the WNBA, my first call was going to be to you. I told you that. I wanted to make sure I surrounded myself with people that were passionate, that were smart, that were innovative, that would be creative. And I knew that some leaders or even some friends 
get caught up on, oh, is, is she smarter than me or she this or she that? Recognize the talent. You know, like I always say that I that I can see talent. I see quality talent or I see potential because back when I was young, someone saw something in me that I didn't see in myself. It was my high school coach and my mother trusted her. And she told my high school coach, oh, Renee should go to college. No one in my family had ever gone to college. And so someone paved the way and showed me some things one, when I was 12 and 13 and 14 years old. We all have someone in our lives like that, okay? But what I think that we all should do is serve. Like, I really feel like I'm this servant. That If you can't see it, I'm going to keep showing you it and keep showing you it. But at the same time, learn. Because as much as you say I've given you, you've given me. And that's what I think true friendship and true mentorship is about. It's not just about the mentor. It's about the mentee as well. You can learn. So many times people think, oh, it's a mentor. You, no, 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 no. The mentee can teach you. Your friends can teach you. Your friends can show you. A true friend will show you the good and the bad. They just won't like, you know, yes, 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 yes. Angela, I remember a time where um, I won't say any names, but you'll remember someone had made me really mad. And I had gone and told them exactly what I thought. And I remember just saying, oh, Renee, I wish you would have counted to 10 or something before you <laughs> went there. And, but I had already gone there. Right. But after I left it, I said, Angela was right. I should have stepped away, thought through it before I reacted, not react through emotion but react through after I've thought through it. Sometimes people will push your button and make you react when you don't want to react. And then you got to recognize, no, 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 no. They may push your button, but it's up to you on how you react. And I think that way back, and that was probably, I don't know, 20 years ago, when you you said something like that to me, and you could have just said, well, you know, I'm going to go with it. You know, I worked with Renee, let her do whatever she wants. You took the time to show me a learning lesson. And so I think that we can all learn from each other. Absolutely. Well, and I would love to dig into various situations because, right, like we can look at, we heard your bio, you've had a remarkable journey, have impacted so many people. Like you mentioned the players, WNBA, but it goes well beyond that. I think that in any interaction that I see you and Renee, you touch the lives of so many, whether it's on a flight, whether it's on a neighbor, whether it's somebody in the store and things aren't always easy. Right, this person that we see show up with such a positive glow also has to navigate those spaces where someone asks you to step back and not to shine, where someone says something to you. So what is that since along your way and along the journey, what have you had to navigate? Because I think that we need to illuminate, particularly for those young people who are starting their journey, mm -hmm. illuminate what life really is like. I think the biggest navigation that I have had is the things I say to myself. Mm. See, people can say whatever they want to say, but at the end of the day, you can either accept it or reject it, right? But it's what are you saying to yourself in your quiet time? Am I good enough? Am I smart enough? Can I do the job? Can I do this? Can I raise a family? Whatever it may be, the questions that you're asking yourself, I think we've all navigated through bosses and colleagues and friends that came out to be not who they are, you know, or who you wanted them to be. Sometimes I put, give people credit or put them on a pedestal when I was younger before they earned it. I just did it out of title alone. You know what I mean? Instead of just watching them and learning from them because character and integrity and honesty and communication those are all things that are important to me. They all, and they all have been. So sometimes I think we got to, as we're, we're navigating through it, it's really like pay attention to how people act. You know, if you see someone, and, and it's old school, like I'm old school, honesty and trust is very important to me. And I think communication is important too. And so I think as you're trying to navigate through, watch the things that you're saying to yourself. And to your point, Surround yourself around with people who who have you your best interest in sight. I remember I was in, I think, the Czech Republic, and I was talking to an executive from, I think, Ghana or somewhere. One of my bosses came up to us and she said, oh, she works for me. She didn't introduce herself. 
she didn't say, hey, I'm so-and-so. She, in that moment, felt that the need to take away whatever that conversation what I was having with this older man uh, that was an executive. And he, and we kind of looked at each other and the one Renee would have, <laughs> would have had to check her. But then I stepped back and I just said, oh, let me introduce the so-and-so, blah, blah, blah. She's my boss. And when I walked away, I said, oh, I'm so glad I handled it that way, you know, because I think sometimes with all of us, our ego gets in the way and we've got to step away from our ego and just be who we truly are. Be truthful and true to thyself. I think that as I've matured, that's what I'm really realizing. It's not what people say to you. And I know that we're a tribe and we all got to get along, but it's really what, what are you, what are you carrying on the inside? Yes. Well, and, and that story in and of itself underscores what our listener who left the review said, like, right, over sometimes moments where like you feel like no one else just saw what happened. But the fact that in that moment, your colleague from Ghana saw and noticed exactly what you saw, like, so that, that validation that sometimes shows up, because I think sometimes, I'm not sure if this was your experience, Renee, but there were times that I felt something, I had an experience, and I wasn't sure if it was me, or am I making something out of right, nothing? Right. Or is that, did, did that really happen? And there was no one else in that space, oftentimes people that didn't look like me, that saw it either. Did you have those experiences in, in different places? Like, right, where, is it just me or is something happening here? Oh, absolutely. And you know, I, I will tell every one of your listeners, trust that instinct. What you felt was real. It's how you want to handle it. There's going to be times where you're going to, you'll do what I just did and say, oh, blah, blah, blah. There may be times where you subtly have to say something back to them. If you don't want to do it in front of a crowd, then you take them behind closed doors and say to them, hey, you know, in this situation, let me tell you how you made me feel. Because sometimes people may not even be aware that they did what they did. But sometimes it's intentional. I had a job and I had taken this job and there was someone there before I got there. Down the road, as the journey was going on, she was trying to block me in so many different ways. And I'm like, okay, the first time I kind of like let it go. And the second time I'm like, wait, she just, they did that again. About the third or fourth time I said, no, 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 it can't happen like this. So I went to their office, closed the door and gave them those examples. And I said to them, you know, listen, if I'm here to do a job, if you wanted the job, you should have applied for it. <laughs> but since they gave me the job, you got to let me do the job. Once I said that, they got out of my way. So sometimes, you know, you have a right, in my opinion, to stand up for yourself and to let people know you made me feel this certain way. And then I think if you keep noticing it happening to you in different situations, then you have to go back and check yourself and ask yourself, why? Am I feeling this way? And what can I do about it? What can do I need to pivot? Do I need to change? Am I taking things too personal? I can literally say when I on my journey of my career, one of the things that I when I think through it that I wish that I could have done different is not take things so personal. I take things so personal because I think emotion can get in the way of strategy. And so you've got to be able to look at it and say, okay, is it me? Is there ways that I can change so I won't constantly feel a certain way? So those are questions you've got to ask yourself. Really important point, because I think so often the world and the universe wants us to think it's our fault. Right, right. And so then that requires us to lean in or do things differently or work harder or get to work earlier. All those things that we see so often happening for Black women, because you're like, is it me? Am I less than? Am I the one that's causing these outcomes? And you're spot on in saying, we need to pause and really reflect and see, is it us or is it the system that we're navigating, right? And what can I control and what can't I control in those situations? And I love how you navigated those interactions um, and you were noting how you felt and you were able to say, like, right, you weren't attacking them, you weren't pointing the fingers, right? You were able to say, this is how you made me feel. And I think that's really important because I know for action-oriented, results-driven individuals and leaders such as yourself, right? So often we focus on the next thing to do versus being able to sit and marinate, if you will, in how we're feeling. Like when you've had those experiences, Renee, like how were you feeling? 
I think it's important for us to actually note and notice what you just said, how we're feeling in those moments. There were so many different feelings. You, you know, there's a feeling of, am I adequate? Am I good enough? Do I understand the information? Am I smart enough? So it was more of those types of feelings where I was placing doubt in my own mind. Okay. And I can remember that situation I was telling you about. I'm like, wait a minute. I know this is what is happening. Right. And I was beginning to doubt me knowing that I had done the work. I think in your moments of doubt, you stop, you stop and you question yourself and you remind yourself of who you are and the work you've done. Okay. You put in the work. That's I think I said it earlier. Once you serve the work, you got to respect the outcome. You do the work and whatever the outcome may be, because you know that you did the best that you can do. I don't care who it is, you know, trying to make you either doubt yourself or is it good enough? You just got to understand I did my best. If I can learn from doing my best to even get better, I will. But I'm not going to let anyone or not even myself make me doubt myself at that level. So serve the work, do the work and respect the outcome. Yes, thanks for that, Renee. And I, I want to spend a, a couple moments um, sharing a couple stories that, that we have in common and kind of unpacking or unlocking this club, because I think there's so many things that happen frequently for Black women in particular, but anyone in a marginalized or historically excluded identity where there's this sense of being invisible that happens, whether it's at the grocery store and you're walking out the door and someone asks you for the receipt when there were like 10 people that walked out before you with a cart full of stuff, right? And they didn't say a word. And, you know, my dad told me a story about my mom, you know, earlier on in her life, I think she was, uh, you know, just had one kid, just my oldest brother at that time, and they were in a grocery store. <laughs> And someone questioned her. She wore those progressive glasses. Uh-huh. Uh, and he'd never told me this story. Um, so she was in the grocery store and she came in. It was in Arizona. They were living in Arizona. She had sunglasses on because, right, the progressives, it was dark. Uh-huh. And she got up to the register. Obviously, it was normal glasses because the sun wasn't out. And the lady, as she was ringing her up, is like, are you going to pay for those glasses too? <laughs> and my dad said, my mother, again, she paused for a second And she let the lady know, look, you can take the rest of this stuff in those bags and this cart back. We will no longer be shopping here. Like, right? That stuff happens all the time. And it's death by a thousand paper cuts. It's subtle. It's silent. Sometimes it feels like it's insignificant, but it adds up. Mm -hmm. There was a story that that I think to uh, to these days, because as we would travel, we traveled quite often with the WNBA, you even more than I. And I remember one particular flight where we were flying back from the West Coast, I believe, uh, on a red eye flight. And we got back to Newark. And um, this happens to me all the time. It particularly happened in that moment with you. But when I would fly back, I'd be waiting at baggage claim and just someone would come stand right in front of you and wait to grab their bags. Like, right. And it just annoyed me. And I'm like, do you not see me here? And I remember this moment. We were at baggage claim in Newark uh, airport. And we were standing there. I know I was thinking about like, I didn't get much sleep on this flight. I can't wait to get home so I can go to sleep. And some gentleman came and stood right in front of you and I, right? And in that moment, I know we looked at each other, right? That, how frequently does that happen to you? And how does that make you feel? Because I don't think we talk about this enough. I think it happens to all of us. And I think we got to get to a point of, although you've been disrespected, respectfully say to them, Excuse me. Now, 10 years ago, I would have said, tell them to get out of your way. You know, but there's better ways that we can do it. But yes, the whole, when I think about invisibility, I say, maybe they can't see. So I'm not invisible. Maybe they can't see. You know what I mean? And so, sir, excuse me, I was standing here first. And I refuse, when I tell you refuse to let anybody make me feel, and I go back to my mother, invisible, because we're not. We are not. And I think the ones that try to make us feel invisible is because they feel small. They feel small. So if they can make you feel smaller, then they feel big for some other reason. But this whole invisible part, you got you to reverse that. I refuse to be anybody's victim. I'll tell you a story. That happened to me at the airport. And that same type of thing happened to me a number of times. 
And it was early in the morning and I pushed the guy. I mean, I regretted it because I said, what if I got to my office and he was having a meeting? Exactly. You know, you, you can't you can't do it that way. But yeah. I just think in all, in all of our I mean, we all get these biases that happen to us. And I think you have to check them. I mean, I have gone to meet a friend that had a private plane and got to the private terminal. And I've only done it one or two times. And they actually thought that I was working there. Right. And how do you handle that in that situation? I think there's times we can educate people in those situations on the spot, educate them. But it's how you say it. Some people will say, forget that, Renee. Tell them exactly. I've learned, no, no, you don't always have to approach things in that manner. You can stop them and say, excuse me, and kind of do what your mother talked about. Yes, no, it's so important there. And, and uh, hopefully I'm not spilling the tea here, but there's one more story I would love for you to share. Like, So if you're in the WNBA, like right, Renee has been in probably every arena, many around the world. And if you're in New York, right, right Madison Square Garden is one of the, the main arenas, the marquee arena to, to go to games. And so there were so often, like even for me, like when I was working at the WNBA, if I would ask for tickets to a particular game, I might get some some seats right behind courtside, mm-hmm. right, in the, in the commissioner's box. But Renee, you shared a story with me a little less than a year ago, right? right? Um, and I'm wondering if you would be willing to share that story because it's a perfect example of no matter what. I think so often people assume that when you make it big, Right. Whether it's like when you're when you're doing fine financially or you have a certain title or you're working for a certain company, all these things go away. And oftentimes those people that assume that are in a different identity than us. Despite all of that. Right. You still have those moments that bring you back down and say, look, this world is not what we thought it was. And all those things that I've done, how hard I've worked, people are trying to strip it away from you. But you can't let them. Right. I think we just got to always be true to the truth, no matter who you are, what you are. There's certain things you hope to change, but we're long away from changing. I was at a college basketball game and I had gotten these tickets from the head of the company and I'm coming down to my seat. I can see in front of me and I could see the ticket guy standing like in front. But everybody that went down and sat in that seat, in that row, he didn't say anything to. Him. So when I got to my seat and sat down, he asked me for my ticket. And I looked at him and I said, wait a minute, I saw you as I was coming down and you did not ask anyone for their ticket. Why are you asking me? And if you look down the row, I was the only person of color. And he said, no, 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 man. I said, no, no. Think about what just happened here. And maybe there's a learning lesson for you. You didn't ask anyone else, but you asked me. I'm going to bring that up to the person who gave me the ticket. Because you, in a sense, and I don't know if I said this to you, Angela, he needed some training. I don't even think he was aware or maybe he was aware. I think I'm getting tired of saying to myself, oh, maybe they're not aware. Yeah, I think there are people out there that are aware. And I think it's all in how you say it. I just brought it to his attention. Now, what he does with it going forward, maybe he'll think through it. So maybe everybody that comes down and sat in that row the next night, maybe he'll ask everyone or he'll recognize who he is asking. But I think we as a people of color, black women, I'm used to it. Like, I don't defend my existence. Mm. Does that make sense? Oh, my goodness. I don't. I don't defend my existence. We are here. I think it was Don Staley that said this to me. I think so many times what happens to people with their own insecurity and fear comes from is because they know that we're capable of anything that they put before us, we're capable of accomplishing. People know it, but I think it's more important that we know it. We've got to quit this thing of thinking that my identity, and I think the biggest lesson I learned, and I'm like all over, the biggest lesson I learned is like when I stepped away from the WNBA, people that I helped, oh, I can't even believe, helped years, you know, whether it be at the league or in different areas. Those were the people that I thought would, I would call once I decided, hey, I want to I want to get back into doing certain things. Right. I didn't hear from any of them. So many of them. So. Many, and I'm so glad it happened. I'm so glad that because I thought, oh, for sure. But when it didn't happen, 
I had to go through this transition of feelings. And then I had to say, well, what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? One thing I want to really correct also is that the company where I was heading up their um, leadership department in diversity, equity, and inclusion, I actually left that and I'm just okay. like an advisor to them. So I'm just, okay. in a, I'm in an advisory world. So I want to make sure that I put that out there. Okay. No, that is great. And, and Renee, I want to dip into where you were leading us because the last, it feels like the last couple of years, we started to hear these conversations, particularly in sports and entertainment, where in the NFL, where you don't see a lot of representation in positions that aren't around the players, right? In the leadership positions or the external relations positions that have to do with the revenue mm-hmm. area. And it feels like so often, if you aren't on the field or courts, right? They want to keep you in certain positions. You talked about this, like you have to trust and lean into what you bring to the equation, Mm -hmm. even if they don't see it in you. Like, do you have any perspective? And I think that what happens in the sports industry is reflected in corporate America in general, but the roles that they invite us to participate in. You know, of course, I've, I've thought about this a lot too, Angela. I, I've thought about it. And then when I see whether the president of the Raiders or the president of Denver or Synth Marshall, who's the president now of the Dallas Mavericks, you know, when you see people in those roles, you know that there's a possibility. But I think you got to know it inside of yourself. You know, I think that one of the things that you've got to ask yourself is what do you want to do? For years, I used to think, that they boxed me in and kept me just in a certain role. But when I've stepped away from it and I realized, no, I boxed me in. And so if there's something that you're interested in, you've got, again, do the work, plan it, and get yourself in front of people that will be a champion for you. Show through your work that you're capable. Take stretched assignments. Get outside of that role because... Forever, I was only known as Renee Brown WNBA. If people would introduce me, that's how they introduced me, right? I love the league. I'm so happy to see it. What I think in its 27th year, you and I started that thing. I wanted to be successful. And I think 20 years in, I kind of knew, okay, now what else can I do? So I say to anyone, whether they're transitioning or questioning or pivoting, sit back and ask yourself, what is it that you want to do? And then you, you know, through the help of others and and God as well, then you go make it happen. But I think that when you talk about unlocking the club, I think part of the unlocking is to unlock the thoughts that have locked you in. But so many times we lock ourselves in or we're waiting on them or we're waiting on that person or we're waiting on this instead of saying, you know, and and Angela, you do it best. I want to do this. I'm going to go do the work. It's going to be hard but I'm going to make it happen. And I think we got to get away from, we are qualified. We are qualified and we got to know it. I think it was, oh, who wrote the book? Expect to win. Carla Harris. Carla Harris. Okay. That's a book I think everybody should read because here she is a Harvard grad coming into, you know, Wall Street, knowing what she's doing, but her boss was so intimidated by her that he would tell her, no, that's not right. No, that's not right. No, that's not right. I think she lived that way for almost a year until she realized, no, no, it is him, not me. And so I think that we've got to know we're capable and we've got to we got to surround ourselves with people that you can vent to and and vent with and strategize with. Because I think I realize if you complain, someone said this yesterday to me, if you find yourself complaining all the time, change probably needs to happen. Either change your mind, change your situation. But if you're finding yourself complaining all the time, then you need to venting. Okay. Because you can strategize through that. Okay. We we can, okay, let's try this or try that. But when you're complaining and you're waking up and you're not happy, then I think it's really time for you to just think about pivoting or changing. Yeah. So many things that you just illuminated and you know, for me and with some of my coaching clients, the question I'll ask quite a bit is when we start to ruminate on the same things, we'll pause and say, is that true or is it just a story you're telling yourself? Because I think sometimes 
we get so much comfort in this story mm -hmm. that we actually can't let it go. Mm -hmm. And is it serving you well to hold on to that story? Have there been times where you've had to take that pause and reflect and to say, is this true or is it just a story that I'm telling myself? Because I think it shows up quite a bit where there's jobs that we think that we're qualified for and we actually are, but we say, we got to stay here. Like I'm really good at, in this box. Absolutely. I mean, absolutely. And I think that if we're all honest to ourselves, we've all, we, we've all told ourselves that story. And it is, you got to change the story. You know, I would always just say to myself, oh, I can only do this. No, no. If you do this well, you can take those same set of skills and do them somewhere else. Because so many skills that we do, they're transferable. Like, can I be a surgeon tomorrow? No, I'm not trained in that. But when I think about working with people in any area, in any, because I think so many companies, what we forget is that a company is made up of people. And I know that I have the ability, no matter where it is, to work with people and bring out the best in people and in teams. Because I think about people as being teamed at a company on a mission. And if we can all communicate and get on the same page, the mission can happen. But I was just stuck in, I can only do basketball. I think I was stuck there because it was comfortable. It's what I knew. You know, and so I think sometimes we get stuck in the spaces because that's what we know. Instead of recognizing, no, we can take what we know and transfer it to do something else. And so I think it is the story that we tell ourselves. And I think it's also important that we start listening to the story that we tell ourselves. And so I think it's important for me, I have to get in a quiet space every day and listen to all this white noise that's going through my head, right? Because we're all there. But I think one of the hardest things to do, and I found it really hard when I retired from the WNBA, is sit still. Is sit still and really start listening to the things that you're telling yourself. And it's almost like riding a bike. You've been telling yourself that for so long. Then when you stop, you're like, what? You know, so I would advise everyone to get still and listen to the story that you're telling yourself. I think it would be helpful. Yeah, I agree. And I think, why are you telling yourself that story? Because again, to a certain extent, like, right, it's to comfort yourself mm -hmm. or to protect you from something. And so mm -hmm. like, what's at the root of why we are telling ourselves these things? Uh, and if you are able to unpack that, like that can unlock so much for you in your future. And then Renee, as you were talking, it reminded me there was a, I'm going to paraphrase this a little bit, but in the article about Lewis Hamilton, he is good friends with uh, Melody Hobson. Mm -hmm. And I know you mentioned the new ownership group in Denver. I think Condoleezza Rice and Melody Hobson are two um, members of the new ownership group. So it'd be really interesting to follow them as they be part of this NFL private mm -hmm. club that um, the owners typically are. But one of the things that uh, Melody said to, to Lewis Hamilton was, I just kept telling him things like, we make no decisions in times of great anguish or pain. You have to sit with this and it's going to be hard and uncomfortable, but there's nothing to be done at this moment. So do nothing. And that was in response, he had lost a race and it was controversial ending to this race. And he was apologetic to people like Melody Hobson who had traveled across the world to see him race and he'd lost this, they couldn't understand. And he was so gracious mm -hmm. in defeat. Mm -hmm. But he also was trying to evaluate, you know, did this happen to me because I was a black man? Like all of those things that we tell ourselves. And she said, like, right, you make no decisions in times of great anguish or pain. What would you say for so many of us, like, right, in those moments um, where we are trying to make life changing decisions, then there's that core hurt mm -hmm. that shows up. What advice do you have for people to navigate that? You know, and I forgot where I read it and it resonated with me, but it's something like, don't let a short come decision affect a long term outcome. Because I think so many times when we're hurt, we can make poor decisions. And the idea of sitting back and walking through how you feel and first accepting this is how I feel and just working that out and having true sistership friendships that you can call up someone and say, hey, this is how I feel. I've made decisions in my life that I know when I look back on, I'm not going to say the poor decision was probably not the right decision, right? But if I would have had the courage 
to call up a couple of my friends and say, hey, this is what I'm thinking about and just kind of get some guidance, you know, or a different perspective before I made the decision. I think that the outcome would have been different, but it was because of my emotion that I made that decision. And then my fear to call up friends that I so-called trusted or family members that I so-called trusted to have a conversation with them to say, hey, this is how I feel. And I think so many times as I'm not going to try to, I'm just going to speak for me as a black woman. I think so many times as I'm trying to make decisions, I think I have to make them by myself. And I don't. And I think the reason why I think I have to make them by myself is because my ego gets in the way. Well, I'm strong. I'm this. I can do this. I, you know, I'm, I'm mature. I can do this. And those are just, no, you got to be willing to be vulnerable. That whole daring greatly, that whole dare of just putting yourself out there, letting people know, you know, how you feel and what you feel. And I think that for years we think or we've been taught that, no, we can't show that. That's a strength of weakness. That's all BS. And I can say it because I lived it and I walked that path in that manner. No, there's got to be people out there that you trust that will give you some good advice, even maybe advice you don't want to hear. But you got to recognize, raise your hand, call people that when you're going through transitions or or a situation that you need a different perspective on. Yeah. Well, we talk a lot about this a lot around like our health, like mm-hmm. right of like how we sometimes choose to go it alone and does that serve us well and when doesn't it serve us well can you talk a little bit about your choices of like when you are now now that you know things differently what choices are you making about when to share and when to leverage those friendships or mentorship that you have to help you navigate some challenges that may be confronting you and when not to when you mentioned something about health and, you know, years and years ago, I went through this health issue and I went through it alone, except for with my family. No one in my, in my closest friendships knew. I probably didn't tell you till like a year later. So I look back on that. I'm like, oh my God, Renee, why, why didn't you share that? And I've thought about it. And I, honest to God, if I had to tell the honest to God truth, now that I'm separated from it, I was almost ashamed of it. Like I had something to do to what happened to me, right? This health scare that I had and, and, you know, and I'm fine. But when I was in the middle of it, I realized I didn't tell anyone because I was ashamed. And I'm like, oh my God, how could you have put something that you had nothing to do with your health and come up with the word shame? Shame locks you up, Okay. Shame does not allow you to get to a place where you're trying to go. I didn't know it when I was going through it, but now that I've stepped away from it, I'm able to say, this was the feeling that I was feeling. Now today, (laughs) and I think through my journey of just being still and quiet and reflection, I recognize you, if you have a group of people that you trust, you got to trust them in the good times. And trust them in the bad times. So many of us want to go to our friends when things are good. Or my family. Or go to my family when things are good. You know? But your family and friends, if they're your true friends, you can go to them in any situation. In any, whatever you got going on. And I think what I've learned from what I just said, I've said to myself, why didn't you go to them? It's because you thought you were going to be judged. The whole judgment part, you know, are they going to judge me because I did this? Or are they going to judge me? But your family and friends who you say love you and you love them, there's no judgment. And we got to quit telling ourselves shame and judgment. These are all negativities, you, you know, that you got to work through in your head. I find now it's easier for me to talk to. I've got a ton of sisters. Certain things I would talk to them about a while now. It's like, hey, let me tell you what I'm going through. But yeah, I just think that you've got to be willing to open up to people that you say that you care about and care about you. Well, and and I'd be remiss if I don't dig a little bit more into this. Like there's two words that you said to me that that show up. I'm like, okay, there's there's times that that shows up for me. But how do we how do we shift that? You said you felt ashamed Mm -hmm. or shame Mm -hmm. judgments. 
like what's what's at the root of that? Like tell me more about like how did that seed get planted in you in the moment where you need support, right? Where you do have this health scare that you feel ashamed or that you'll be judged. You know, I don't know. I can honestly say while I was in the midst of it, I actually say it had to be my ego. Like we walk around thinking we have to be perfect in every area that we do. And then all of a sudden we come up with this thing. And I think it's ego. I think my ego got in the way because to be shamed of something that you have nothing to, just the word shame there, you should never be shamed in your family and friends. You just should not be, you know, because they, they should be accepting you as you are. And then you accepting you as you are, you know, even the judgment part, you're going to ask yourself, do you judge? Do I feel I'm going to be judged because I'm judging? So I have to step back and say, okay, am I judging? Sometimes you go through things and you don't know why. Like if I could go back and rewrite 10, 12 years ago when I was going through my health scare, I didn't tell anybody on my job. No one knew. I had a surgery. No one knew. And it was not out of privacy at the back then I thought it was. And after I've gone back and really thought through it, it's out of shame. And we've got to recognize when we're feeling those ways and then ask ourselves why. Well, and I think in any feeling, you've got to step back and say, okay, now why am I feeling that way? I'm going to say mine was my ego thinking that we have to be perfect all the time and everything that we do and all our work and how we exist and walk through the world. And that, I don't want to call it a lie, but that's a myth. That's not the truth. And I think the minute that we realize in our life experiences, it's a flow. It's going in all different ways. We're riding this wave and we're learning as we're going through this life. But no, we've got to be, we got to be better and be, be good to ourselves. Be good to ourselves. And, you know, a few episodes ago, we had a, a mutual colleague of ours, Teresa Edwards, was on a show with me. Um, we were talking about, we were unlocking uterine fibroid. Mm-hmm. Right. And so, um, you know, we both had the uterine fibroid immunization treatment and um, I had it when I was in Atlanta. And what, what you were just saying reminds me of that because I was leveraging a version of that. Don't ever let them see you sweat. Mm-hmm. When that was happening. And so certainly just leading up to the surgery, not letting people know like how much pain I was going through as I was losing, you know, ounces of blood on a regular basis. But even when I had the surgery, I didn't tell anybody except the people that needed to know that I was having surgery. And my friends laugh about it now, but they're like, literally, they were rolling me into surgery and I was on the phone negotiating a contract for Swin Cash, right? Mm -hmm. For us to to sign Swin Cash, right? And I'm telling them to go, I needed some groceries. So here's my wallet, take the blue credit card to go buy some things. And they were like, you were trying to do too many things as they're literally rolling you out of the room to go to surgery. And then after surgery, they said you're supposed to be in bed for a few days. I was trying to go to practice. So people didn't know that I'd had this and I was in so much pain until Teresa was like, Angela, you got to start. you need to eat something. You need to get some rest. You need to take your medication. But the thing that was showing up for me, and it probably was inside of that judgment mm-hmm. that I wasn't doing my job. Right. They had got me here to do a job. And I just started maybe a couple months prior to that. And so I didn't want to show weakness that I wasn't capable of doing this job. And so I went to extreme lengths, right, to show up that I was going to work 24-7 to get my job done when it wasn't serving me well. And I think we need to know what shows up in those moments for us. You know, Andrew, I'm sitting here just reliving, listening to you, reliving. I did the same thing. I had a surgery on Thursday. I have one of my sisters over in my house and watching me walk to make sure I wasn't walking weird. So somebody would, it wouldn't give it away. And I went to work on Monday. Yeah. So, cause I didn't want people to think I'm not doing my job. I don't want no one to know that I'm like, I went through this surgery, all of this nonsense. And we have to step back and ask ourselves, where did that come from? And what can we do about it? And we need to understand, no, 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 no. Life happens. You got to roll with life. We're not trying to be superwoman, although we are. But we need to serve ourselves better, serve our families better, serve our, you know, because I think if I would have told my staff, it would have given them an opportunity to be independent, to make decisions. Renee's not here. I can take care of this. Instead of Renee thinking, I have to be there. And you don't. I think for all of us, and I bet you so many of us have that same story 
that, you know, that if we don't show up, I used to give back vacation days, mm-hmm. gave them back. I mean, when I think back on it, because I thought that I just had to be at work. There's no days off. I would give back two weeks, three weeks. And Sonia, I think it was, it's like, wait a minute, it's healthy for you and the company to take that time off, to get yourself, to re-energize yourself and have confidence in yourself that it goes on. So really take time for yourself. So important. And I think it's one of the keys to unlocking the club. I want to talk to you about those clubs that we try to get in. But one of the things that I know that I thought and had ingrained in my mind was that in order to get into that club that I thought I wanted to get into, and it was the executive club or feeling like you had arrived, was that I had to work harder and better than anybody else. And so that is what fueled showing up in those moments when you weren't taking care of yourself. Or we had a colleague, Brett, who so artfully crafted his schedule when we would be traveling overseas, he either on the front end or the back end would tag on some vacation days. So he got to enjoy with his family like time traveling abroad. Mm -hmm. And I know for so many times for those 10 years, I was at the WNBA, we would fly in and fly out of cities when we're scouting games or going international. And I recognize now that my focus was on the work. And while the work got me opportunities, it was the relationships that were going to open those doors to maybe not the club that they don't want us to belong in, right? Because that's a club that we're not going to get access to, but into other clubs that would maybe give me opportunities that I really want and was seeking. Mm -hmm. And so I think the relationships, you talked about this earlier, and I think this is your gift. Renee is a unicorn, folks, around relationships. Like she has this this skill and this ability to be able to connect with someone who is a billionaire in one moment and maybe someone who is an environmental um, scientist or someone who is is cleaning the building in the other moment and make them feel seen. Talk to me about your understanding of how important relationships are to navigating corporate America. Sure. I want to first address what you said about the club. I say we should ask ourselves, why do we want to go to specific clubs? What's our reason? What's the purpose and the why? I think it was Ava DuVernay that when she first got into films, she wanted to acknowledgement, whether it be from the Oscars or whatever the film world was, right? And then she, I think when she was getting ready to direct Selma, I think it was a movie, and check it if I'm wrong, but I think this is what she was talking about. So she was so busy trying to get acknowledgement from all these people in all these different clubs, right? And then she wanted to direct Selma, and then it hit her, I just want to serve the work. I just want to serve the work, one. And why don't I start my own clubs, two? Mm. Why do we have to go in certain clubs? Why can't we get our own clubs? And I think so many of us, we go through work and situations thinking we have to be a certain way to join. Most of these clubs that we're talking about, half of the people in them probably didn't even earn it. So (laughs) we need to just step back and say, why do we want to be in specific clubs? I think just do our best, be our best. And if if there's an opportunity, take it. And if there's not, go create one. And when I think about relationships, I think that, and I just think it's our society. I think our, our society has put in all of these different rules and regulations, right? At the end of the day, I know people are people. Is it that easy? Probably not. Okay. Because you, you know, it depends on what, whatever. I just try to live my life true to me. I try to treat people the way I want to be treated. I know, um, and you see where our country is today. Our country where it is today is because people are not communicating. People are not talking to each other. You know, you get to know people, you'll see things, you'll get a broader perspective on things. And as long as we can keep putting different levels of she's this and he's that and they're this and that, that that division will remain. Some people want it to remain. I try to live my life every day by acknowledging another person. We all serve a purpose. We all are here for a reason. And I know anyone that I come in contact with, I'm sure that there's something that I could learn from them and they can learn from me. So I just try to be as Renee, I used to say, Maybe I need to change. And I'm like, heck, I'm not changing. You know, I wouldn't even know who to be, you know, because I can only be I can only be who I am. And people will either accept me as I am. If not, then I'm probably in the wrong place. Shine the light on who you are. 
be bold, be authentic, be you. And, you know, you talked about Ava du DuVernay. You mentioned earlier in our conversation how you used to put people up on pedestals, mm -hmm. right? And I think that that shows up quite often for us of trying to get into that club because we think the people in that club are remarkable. And first and foremost, there's nothing remarkable about them oftentimes, like, right? The things that we think yes. people, who they are when they have a certain title mm -hmm. or certain number of zeros in their bank account mm -hmm. is actually not true. And I think we do need to create our own clubs as opposed to aspiring to be in a club where, where we actually don't care to be part of any of those things that are showing up. And I know we've had this conversation, you, you mentioned purpose, purpose driven. I know in sports and entertainment for me, and it's maybe true for you as well, is there is a certain drive to be front and center, right? Mm -hmm. To sit in court side, all the glamour and the fame. And I think what people missed was that, at least for, for me, it wasn't about all of those things. I could care less. It was about the purpose. It was about giving these women right. the opportunity to play basketball here in front of their friends and family, not have to travel across the globe. Like, what do you think people miss about, and I think it happens for Black women in particular, how purpose-driven we are. Purpose-driven sometimes is not glamorous. It's not what you see, you, you know, what, what society is showing us. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes all of us and young people, that you kind of want to you run to the thing that's got the biggest glare, you know what I mean? And sometimes the biggest glare may blind you on who you really are. Because you can get caught up in all that. You can get caught up in it. You'll get caught up in it and lose yourself around along the way. And I think if you can just stick to your own purpose, it may not be, you know, the hip thing to do or the cool thing to do, but eventually the difference that you will make long term is much bigger than that part that people think is so glamorous. Now, some people will say, oh, Renee, you got to be kidding me. No, no, no. I really believe that when you do the work and you stay true to yourself and you be intentional about it and you're willing to help others. Good things will come to you no matter what. They may not come. Was it Don or a lot of people say delayed does not mean denied. Delayed does not mean denied. You know, it may not come when you want it to come. I'm a faithful woman. God is always on time. So it may not come when you want it to come or get what you want to have. But if it's meant for you, it will happen. It may not happen the way you think it should happen, but I believe that it will happen. And I think that Sometimes what can happen to people that if it doesn't come when they want it to come, they either settle or they give up and you can't, you got to keep the fight because I think everything that most of us have, we fought for, it was not given to us. And, and when I, when I say that, I, then I say, and yet we ended up at the same spot. Who's stronger is the person that went from A to Z straight on or is it us that went, you know, over the hills and through the woods to get yeah. to that point? There's strength yeah. that happens in that. Yes, yes. There's a lot of strength. Like, right, that being anti-fragile, it makes you stronger mm -hmm. as you're navigating those different obstacles. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that one of the things that as you're navigating those obstacles, what oftentimes shows up, this showed up for me and I think it with, with other peers, is there's a presumption that there's certain things, the spotlights or you know, maybe the sprinkling of a little bit of cash is enough to keep us happy. But there's a gap between those things and the purpose driven life that we're trying to fulfill. And I felt like at certain stages in my career, and I'm wondering if this is, is present for you, where people thought you should be happy with that. And my sense was they thought I should be happy with that because that's good enough for a black girl. You should be happy with that title. You should be happy with this amount, even though there's a huge gap in wages or salary between you and somebody else who's in a different identity, you should be happy because that's pretty good for a black girl. Right. Do you sense that that happens in sports and entertainment in the corporate space or for you on your journey? No, I, I think it happens. You know, I think of my mom and she said to me when it comes to happiness, all money ain't good money. Mm. You know, so and when I say that all money ain't good money, meaning you should seek your purpose and you should almost know your worth. So I don't think that anybody, you know, if somebody told me I should be happy with that, I would ask them why. And I think what tends to happen is it's in a sense putting you in your place that this is all worth it. Why? 
why, why, like, you don't know my goals. There's other things that I'm trying to get done. Or you should be happy in that role. Says who? Who defines that for you? You have to define that. And so I tend to run from people that think that I should be happy with this or happy with that or they're paying me well. Well, I've earned it. Because every nickel that we make, every nickel that we make, they're probably saving, keeping a dime. Okay? Yes. So the money that we make, we've earned that money. I've never defended that. Like, no, no. As a matter of fact, I questioned, well, should I be making more? And how and how can that, that happen? I had a story happen to me one time years ago where I just accepted the salary because I, I thought it was a good salary. And I overheard one of my colleagues saying that she negotiated hers. Mm-hmm. And so I went to her and I said, did I just hear you say you negotiated your salary? with the same company. She said, yes. Maybe six months I was already there. I went back to our boss and said, you know what? Didn't know we could negotiate. I'm here to negotiate six months later, right? And so it's almost like I didn't know any better, but I believed I was worth more. And we got to be willing to ask for more. And now I say that you got to be willing to ask for more. But when I say all money's not good money, you know, don't take money that's going to take you away from the values and your integrity and the things that are important to you just for money. Money to me is a service that you're providing and you feel that you've earned that. And then I think it's a fight that we'll continue to fight. But I think also, I think it was, I can't think of the lady's name that wrote the book, Lean In. You got to be willing to step up and ask. And I think that's one area across the board that women, especially in my generation, are afraid to do. But I, I do believe it's different now with these millennials and Gen Z people that they're going in and and asking in a sense demanding. And I, it tickles me because I'm so happy that they're, they're doing that. Yeah, a couple episodes ago, we were talking to Amelia Hardy and and talked about the equal payday for, for, for Black women. It is the end of September of this year where we will earn the same amount that a non-Hispanic white man earned at the end of 2021. So we have to negotiate, we have to fight. And what is true, and again, I, this was true for me, and I think it is for many people, and again, it's not just for, for Black women, but they will have you think that you should be happy mm-hmm. with whatever it is that they give you. But if you know your worth, fight for your worth. And if you are doing twice as much work as your peers, then you need to be making twice as much as they are making. I think sometimes people, you'll say, fight for it, go ask for it. And a question that I remember saying to myself, well, how do I do that? What's the strategy like? And this is where I think that Black women can help each other. You can be coached into that. You can have conversation and say, have you tried this or tried that? I was just um, almost in a sense naive. I just walked in there and said, well, wait, I heard this. And so I'm here to do that. I wouldn't tell people that that's the technique that you should use because I think there's strategy behind negotiation. And I think that you've got to meet with people that have done that and seek out people that can help you in that type of strategy, because you know, you know, when you're not being fairly compensated, you kind of know it. And so you've got to then prepare yourself, be able to back up the work that you've done and what you bring, the value that you bring to a company and be able to go in and there and then talk to whoever it is that's the hiring manager or the manager that's making that decision. Yeah. And there's so much information out there these days, right, where you can do a lot of research and find out like what is the pay range or the pay scale Mm -hmm. for an equivalent position and literally your HR VPs or your contact and human resources, as Renee said, is a resource. They can't maybe tell you specifics, but they can give you a pay range Mm -hmm. and get that information. Do your research Mm -hmm. so you have as much information. And I think the other piece, though, is, is mental. Like it is understanding that negotiating is you have to normalize it. And I think that for sometimes for Black women, we think we're going to show up as an angry Black woman or we're going to be greedy or all those things, those tropes, those stereotypes that we're Mm -hmm. trying to avoid is to notice when those stereotypes that may be out there, that when those have you stop from actually showing up and advocating on your own behalf. Mm -hmm. Because this is a normal process that happens in business. And so, Renee, I want to leave you before we head to the back nine with one last question from actually one of our members of our Code Breakers Lounge. Cheryl left the question and wanted to ask him, if you are not currently a member, please, we have a Facebook group called 
the Code Breakers Lounge, where we continue these conversations. We create a space where Black women, those who identify as Black and female, or those who identify as Black and non-binary, can have a safe space to have these conversations, to continue these discussions, and as, as Renee was talking about, where we can support one another on these journeys. Uh, but Cheryl asked a question. It was, what would you do differently in your career, knowing what you know now? I would not have boxed myself in. I not have, what would not have, for so much of my career, a lot of times people would come to me and offer me a job. And so probably my entire career. And I boxed myself in. And in other words, I gave them control of my life and my career. So that's probably the biggest lesson. And so in saying that, I would have more strategy, more plans in place and kind of know I got in this area of basketball and in my head, I made myself believe that that's all I could do. And so this whole unlocking, the way you're saying it, I had to unlock that because I had the key the whole time. Mm -hmm. I had the key the whole time because I'm thinking, oh, this is all I can do. Instead of saying, wait a minute, I can take my same skills and I can use them at Amazon or at, at any company, you know, and really recognize that. And then I think also what I would do different, I wouldn't wait on people. I'm a go getter, but I still believe somewhere in my head, I found myself waiting on people to tell me when to go instead of just go. And I think that why is it, was I afraid? I, these are questions I've had to, I've had to ask myself, but I would say to your, especially your young listeners, Really just strategize, you know, meet with people, decide on different areas that you want to do. Be willing to pivot because I kind of stayed in a, in a zone where I was comfortable. Although I love the game. I love the game of basketball. But what I even love more, I love the idea of building teams with people. I love the idea of relationship building, no matter what area that it's in. And, and, and being able just to think broader with this skill set and God given talent that God has given me. So I would, just don't box yourself in. Yeah, when I think so many of us subscribe to that this is a meritocracy. If you work hard, if you get results, you're gonna get an opportunity. So you don't have to chime in or speak up for yourself because they're gonna see and they're gonna be like, Renee, Angela, Anka, whoever it is, like here's an opportunity. And that is not how, particularly as you get to the higher mm -hmm. stages of your career journey and the ladder, like they aren't going to pull you through. They're going to pull people through that have relationships with them, that they trust, that they want to be around. And so you have to advocate for yourself. But I want to actually dig in a little bit more, Renee, into this boxing yourself in. So what was at the root of that? Why were you boxing yourself in and how were you boxing yourself? in? The question why I think about every day and I'm still on that journey of figuring out why. Right. When I think about my life. Basketball was so good to me. Basketball has taken me around the world, right? And I loved it, but I just did not think broader in it. So now that I've stepped away from it, I'm like, oh, there's a whole nother world over there that I didn't even know was out there because I was so focused in on, on basketball. And I think some of it, because I've had to ask myself, was I comfortable? Did I settle? Like all of these things come through my mind as I'm trying to work to the point of why was I afraid to go try something else? You know, I read this quote where like, listen, if somebody asks you to do a job, whether you know how to do it or not, say yes and then go figure it out. I'll just address her name as Miss Rita. Miss Rita, she lived to be 104. I met her on a plane, Angela, by the way. And she just passed away, may she rest in peace. And she told me these stories about she was taking these jobs. She had no idea what she was doing, but she knew somewhere in the back of her mind that she was capable of doing a job. And I think that that's where we got to get. We got to get to a point where the skills that you have understand that they can be used in so many other different areas. I mean, yes, if you're a surgeon, that's a trained skill. But if you're working with people on a day to day basis, coaching, you can take those skills and go work in any area of business if you're willing to, to in a sense, take a chance on yourself. I belong to this organization called Win with Black Women. You know, mm -hmm. you know, you got to bet on yourself. You do. You do. You have to bet on yourself. There's a book out um, from Arthur Brooks. He's the, a professor of happiness at Harvard. Um, and it's the book is called Strength to Strength. Mm -hmm. And in that transition, I think so rarely when we maybe come up against those obstacles, do we actually leverage, to your point, those things that we do really well and figure out how we can apply them in different ways. And that 
just because we're not doing the exact same thing that we were doing before, where we're comfortable, where we're confident and we feel competent, doesn't mean that we can't apply them in different spaces. And if you subscribe to the limiting beliefs that will have you stop and say you can't or it's hard or I've never done this before and don't rely on those things that where you indicated you've never done it before and you've been successful. You've never started a, a, a professional women's league, Renee, right? Right. right. But you started right. WNB and now it's the longest running professional league before. And so we have to shift those limiting beliefs to remember where we've had success. If it's something new where you've been able to experience something new for the first time and then be able to thrive, not to survive in that. And I think that shows up quite a bit for all of us as human beings, but I think particularly for women, and I think part of it is the messages that we share with ourselves, but also the messages that the system would have us believe because it's trying to keep us in a certain space. Absolutely. Angela, I just want to build off of what you said about that book, Strength to Strength. And my my takeaway, uh, I had no idea you was going to bring it up. And I said, somehow I've got to get this in here because I it hit me like, wow, when ultimately in the book, the, the author saying, use things, love people and worship the divine. And when I read that, I think so many times we want to love things and use people. And then we want to almost in a sense, worship ourselves, right? I just think in general, as we are walking in this lived experience in our lives, we need to step back and ask ourselves, are we using things? Because they're just things and, and we can share them with people. Are we loving the people that love us or, or even extending that love out and worshiping? I, you know, I'm, I'm a faithful woman. I could not walk this earth without my belief. And so when you brought up strength to strength, and I, that's what I think strength really is all about. It is. It is. And you talked a little bit about like, what is it that you need and what is it that you want? Mm-hmm. There's a distinct between the two. Like, what is it that you really need? And I think that we don't ask ourselves that enough. If it is validation, if it is feedback, we need to ask for what it is that we need. Mm -hmm. And if they say no, that's okay. But if you don't ask right now in the society that we're living in, they're not going to give it to you voluntarily in many instances. So ask for what you want. And that's what I did. And asking Renee to be on my show, I knew that it was a possibility 50-50. She might have said no, but I'm so grateful that she said yes. And I have a few more questions for Renee Brown here on Unlocking the Club. So we'll be right back here with the back nine. Do you want to stop feeling like you have little to no control over your life's journey and instead amplify your life's purpose? You all know me as Angela Taylor, host of the Unlocking the Club podcast, but I am also a business, career, life, and leadership coach helping my clients to live their best life. Every day, I help my clients discover what they truly want in life and then unlock the club on how they can live their best life. If you're like many of my clients, you have found yourself over the years prioritizing everyone else and everything else, your job, your significant other, your family, your friends, your community, the list goes on and on. Well, I'm here to tell you the best thing you can do for others is to invest in yourself. You don't have to have all the answers. You don't need to succumb to the fear of failure. You don't have to be perfect. You don't need to feel like you're being selfish. You simply need to prioritize you. You may be thinking that coaching is for other people, but trust me when I say that we all could benefit from a good coaching relationship. Together, we'll build a plan to help you amplify your gifts, clarify your goals, and accelerate your journey toward the life you desire which may be finding financial wealth, spiritual health, relationship success, and or freedom and flexibility. You no longer have to feel like you aren't welcome into someone else's club. Let me empower you to leverage all of your extraordinary gifts and create your own club. Head on over to unlockingtheclub.com to book a free 20 minute introductory call to learn more about our Unlocking Your Journey coaching packages or use code UNLOCK to get a 15% discount on the six month coaching package. Today is the day to invest in yourself. Let's unlock your journey. Hello, I am Angela Taylor, your host with Unlocking the Club, and we've been having a really rich conversation with our guest today, Renee Brown. And I have a few more questions, Renee, before I let you go. I think the first one is you were someone who 
um, is really mindful and has found the space to, to reflect and pause and evaluate and be insightful. So I guess my first question for you is besides your own home, where's the place that you feel safest to be yourself? Besides my own home, I think I'm fortunate because I have a large family. And for a while, I wasn't myself because they saw me there as a sports executive, right? And then I'm like, wait, that, come on, like, this is my family. So a lot of times with any of my family members and my closest friends, and I think that we got to find spaces where we can just be who we are, like, because we're always on and you got to find a place where you can just take a break. And then you got to ask yourself, why can't you be yourself in the spaces where you spend so much of your time? And who says that you can't? Yes. Yeah, that is so good. That's so good. What is a situation that you used to walk into with trepidation that you no longer do? I'm trying to think of where did I feel in the sense where I feel uncomfortable? See, it's yeah. interesting because I think as a black woman in corporate America, we've navigated through spaces where we were the only one, right? All of our lives. So we, we kind of always had to show up. So only if it's a space, it's something I don't understand. If I don't understand, then I will say, oh, well, I don't, I'm not understanding, let's say the CBA when we first started it, right? And somebody would be, oh my God, I don't know, like, you know, but then it hit me, well, wait a minute. I don't know that information. I'm here to learn, but I bring something else to the table. And so what I know, may, they may not know, I can teach them. And what they know, I may not know, and they can teach me. And so that caused me to like, okay, relax. I'll learn it. Yes, right. Like there's always going to be that discomfort, but getting comfortable with the discomfort and knowing that you're going to grow mm -hmm. and be able to learn mm -hmm. is such an important part of the journey. Uh, Renee, what is a, a place right now that you'd love to stroll in and claim a seat? You know, I, when I think about what I want to do next, I think about all these large companies that have so many teams, teammates, like large, big companies where they're ran, they're running these people as if they're machines. You know, I would love to enter to a space where there's a lot of people working in all different walks of life and be able to help them understand the importance of you can even get more done if you communicate, trust, each other and just become like teammates. So I think of big companies that I would like to work with and help n a number of people build relationships with inside their company. There's so many companies, and I think COVID has really hurt us, have caused people to separate and they're, they're not communicating at the level that they communicate out and it's us versus them and this and that. When if you just sit back and just really realize we're all on this planet together, we're all here trying to make a difference and we can work better. And I know that kind of sounds like hokey pokey, but I do believe that if people get to know each other and communicate and respect each other, then no matter what, you can get along. So I like the idea of being in a large company helping to navigate that. Yeah, I don't think that's hokey at all. I think that that is the essence of what we need to get back to. Mm -hmm. And there's something about being part of a team, mm -hmm. right? There's something special about that. And being part is important, like, right? Not being the team, but having a role on a team, no matter how dynamic, mm -hmm. dynamic that role can be. And when I was running um, the Atlanta Dream, one thing I remember having a, a conversation with uh, a group of female leaders once, and I said, in order to have a championship organization, you need to run it like a team. In order to have a championship team, you need to run it like a business. Mm -hmm. And I think those two, like, there's a lot of correlation between those two. And, and oftentimes we aren't intentional in how we design systems and structures in corporate space to operate like a team that can be successful. Right. And, you know, and people always talk about strategy. When I think about business, you got to have strategy, compassion, or heart together to really run a team or to run a business. So many times people just want to do the strategic part and that's it and just do it this way. But you got to go back to these are people. If you get them to understand that you care about them, they're going to give more to you. We've seen it. I've seen it in teams in all in my entire career. And I, that's why I think that the teams I've been a part of have been so successful because we recognize each other. We understand our roles. And listen, roles can change from day to day, right? But really just having a respect for each other. Yeah. And winning is contagious, right? And so the reason that you've been part of winning teams is because of who you are and how you show up in so many of those ways. And 
you, as, as I've talked about throughout the show, you show up fully above and beyond for, for so many people whenever and wherever it is that they need you. And so I'm curious, Renee, how do you actually center yourself? How do you take care of, of yourself? Well, I can do a better job than that. <laughs> I think for me, I've always just tried to be honest with myself. And sometimes the message was so buried in me that the journey of getting to the honesty of yourself is painful. You, you know, like I had to admit, oh, God, I think I was ashamed or I think I was afraid at that point. But really having those conversations with myself and then with people that I trust, you know. But I think it's important that you just know who you are. God, it's a journey. You know, it is one I can feel one day I feel good. Another day I'm like, okay, I need to work on that. So it's a journey. It's, it's never ending. But I think for me to center myself, I have to sit still with myself. I have to spend time in the word. I have to listen to the word. I have to listen to spiritual music. I need that direct connection where I'm in prayer. These things are important to me and they've always been important to me. And when I steer away from that, my equilibrium is off. And so for me to stay centered is on the beliefs that I truly believe in my faith. Mm, that's beautiful. <laughs> well, last question, uh, Renee. You know, one of the things that I think is so important is, is representation. Mm -hmm. And so for me on my journey in the WNBA, it was helpful to see a black woman killing it. Like, right. And that was you, like, right. Knocking out the park to say that there were possibilities. So important for us to see those messages and to have that uh, in our life, wherever it is, whatever the journey is, but also to be seen. And I think that one of the moments that I, I remember quite often, and some of my good friends, my good friend Ethan talks about this all the time is, when I first got to New York, I remember like, right, I'm in corporate America for the first time. I'd been an assistant coach in, in college women's basketball. So this was my first experience in New York, right? So everything was, you know, dark colored suits, right? Chocolate brown, grays, navy blue and black. But I remember one of the first days that I was on the job at the WNBA, you called me and you're like, Hey, let's go to lunch. Let's, let's have a lunch meeting. And so we left and we went to Saks Fifth Avenue. Like, right. And on our way to lunch and it was just like a different world. And it was, I could let my hair down, if you will, in a space, which was so important in a space that you felt like you had to be on your P's and Q's all the time in those meetings. But it was so nice to know I had someone who saw me, who understood me, who literally had my best interest in mind. And so I appreciate that. And I'm wondering for you, like, who was it? When did you feel most seen along your journey? And, and if it was an individual or a situation, I would love to hear. For me, Angela, I have been so fortunate with the people that I have worked with and for. You know, I think I would first probably start, you know, with my mother taking me on as her stepdaughter and saying, I'm going to help you, you know, and then all of the different levels of my life and players, you know, players played a huge role in my life with you being one of them. I just think that I try to surround myself with people that give out positive energy. That's what I really tried to do. And I believe no matter what role that you're in, there's someone watching you when you're not even realizing that they're watching you. So I always say, just do the best that you can do because you don't know who's watching you, you know, and, and I wanted to get that in there. But I've just always tried to surround myself with people that are just good people. And I question whether or not the whole, do they see me versus how am I showing up? That's a thought that I have in my mind. You know, how am I showing up in a situation? My high school coach would tell me, own the room. How am I showing up? And that's at every stage of not just the visual part, but all of it. Like, how am I showing up? Am I speaking up in meetings? Am I getting there early trying to get to know people? Am I leaving late? Am I going to certain events that I may learn something from? So, a lot of it, I say to myself, is it me being seen or is it me? And how do I show up in those situations? Yeah. And that is a great, great thought for us to leave our listeners with, is how are you showing up in each and every situation? How are you showing up? So, Renee, you showed up powerfully. You own the room uh, today here on Unlocking the Club. And again, I cannot thank you enough for being willing to be part of today's episode of this conversation and sharing your journey with our uh, Unlocking the Club audience. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you.
Thanks again for listening to Unlocking the Club. Wow, this was such an extraordinary conversation with my good friend, my mentor, and my angel, Renee Brown. If this conversation resonated with you, please subscribe to our podcast on iTunes or Apple Podcasts or your favorite streaming platform so that you can experience every episode. If you want to continue the conversation with us, head on over to Facebook and search for Unlocking the Club, the Code Breakers Lounge, and be part of our online community where we continue this conversation, we connect, we support, and we grow, and we unlock the club. Thanks again for joining us on Unlocking the Club. Until next time, be well. Thanks for listening to Unlocking the Club. If this conversation resonated with you, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes or your favorite streaming platform so that you can experience every episode. And follow us on social media where you'll hear about future guests, access special features, and connect with this amazing community. Head on over there and let us know how you are unlocking the club. Until next time, peace.